Welcome to this video on sperm DNA fragmentation. My goal here is to talk about what it is and how do we use it as a diagnostic test. My name is Dr. Ryan Flanagan. I'm a urologist and microsurgeon in male reproduction. So what is DNA fragmentation sperm? Basically, it refers to breaks or nicks that are in excess to the DNA within a sperm. So typically DNA always gets little nicks or breaks in part of the processing of DNA naturally. However, when there's a lot of these far in excess of the normal amount, it can be termed DNA fragmentation and it can actually be uh, deleterious or problematic uh, to sperm function. It's really common, about 30% of men being evaluated for infertility will be identified to have elevated DNA fragmentation in the sperm. So how does sperm acquire DNA fragmentation? Well, there's several different theories out there of how this might occur. I'll list a few of them here just to give you some background and insight to this. So abnormal packaging of the DNA within the sperm uh, could certainly be one option that can lead to the DNA being more prone or more susceptible to getting these fractures and breaks. During the process, when DNA gets repackaged uh, within the sperm, you can get both single and double strand breaks that are created to facilitate this process when the DNA is restructured and unwound essentially within the sperm for this repackaging. Typically, these sites of single or double strand nicks are repaired uh, naturally, but if there is a, a defect in the repair mechanism to patch these little breaks in the DNA, then this can lead to an accumulation of too many breaks and DNA fragmentation. If there's incomplete cell death, so these cells are very stressed, uh, this can produce a lot of what we call reactive oxygen species. And essentially, these are basically molecules that can damage cell walls, cell structures, as well as the DNA, and, and can induce little breaks into the DNA that accumulate over time and again lead to too many, and we, we call this uh, DNA fragmentation. Certainly, if there are harsh sperm storage conditions within the epididymis, this is the site where the sperm are stored um, adjacent to the testicle, uh, then you can also result in increased DNA fragmentation. So what are some of the lifestyle factors that can lead to DNA fragmentation that are potentially within our control? So smoking has been one that's been described in literature being associated with impaired sperm quality and function, as well as DNA fragmentation. Obesity is another one that's been associated with impaired semen parameters and sperm DNA damage. Excessive exercise is associated with impaired sperm DNA damage. There are also medications that can impact this called SSRIs or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. These are antidepressants. So there are multiple methods uh, and clinical tests that we can use to measure DNA fragmentation. If you're speaking with your doctor, uh, some of these terms might come up. SED or sperm chromatin dispersion test, sperm chromatin structure assay, SCSA, common assay or tunnel assay. They're all quite good. They measure slightly different uh, factors related to the DNA fragmentation have slightly different reference values, but all have a clinical utility. So it just depends what assay your, your treating physician and uh, your fertility center is used to using. So what does the medical literature say about sperm DNA fragmentation and fertility? In this scientific study, which was a meta-analysis, which is essentially a study that looked at all of the studies that have been published in the medical literature on this very same topic and combine the results in a sophisticated statistical method. They looked at 16 studies here of men with elevated DNA fragmentation and its impact on miscarriage rates. What they found was that amongst those men with a higher DNA fragmentation, the chance of a miscarriage went up by about a factor of two. When they looked at um, some of the indi individual factors, they found that the tunnel assay that we previously talked about, one of the ways of measuring for DNA fragmentation actually had the strongest association with this miscarriage rate. There was also similar findings with a second meta-analysis study uh, by Zhao that demonstrated the chance of miscarriage was about two to two and a half times higher in men with increased DNA fragmentation. Here in this study, 
they compared 22 couples that had recurrent pregnancy loss compared to 20 fertile men that didn't have uh, difficulties with recurrent pregnancy loss. What they found among several other results is that in the men with recurrent pregnancy loss, they had higher DNA fragmentation rates compared to the fertile men. Here, the values were about 17% compared to 10%. Here in a second study, looking at recurrent pregnancy loss and sperm DNA fragmentation, they essentially compared 112 men with recurrent pregnancy loss compared to two other groups, 114 fertile controls and 114 infertile controls. What they found was that the DNA fragmentation rates were higher in the recurrent pregnancy loss group compared to either of the other groups, general and fertile men or general fertile men. What they found was that the tunnel score, the DNA fragmentation score, was positively correlated with the number of miscarriages. So it certainly seems that there's a, a component of DNA fragmentation within the sperm that's contributing to recurrent pregnancy losses. So sperm DNA fragmentation relies on the female egg DNA repair mechanisms to fix the DNA because sperm are quite small in comparison and they're not traveling with all the extra machinery to repair the DNA. So when the sperm enters the egg and releases the DNA content to fertilize, it's really reliant on all the machinery within the egg to repair the DNA. If this isn't uh, an effective process, which we typically see in eggs of women over the age of 35, then the DNA in the sperm can remain damaged and unrepaired and lead to uh, outcomes that aren't as effective as if the DNA was repaired. Another potential option is that the downstream gene expression when the DNA is read um, is disrupted, errors may accumulate in the developing embryo or in the placenta. There's also other abnormalities associated with the same underlying cause that leads to DNA fragmentation that could also be contributing to the recurrent pregnancy loss and miscarriages that we just can't capture with our clinical tests right now. And there's also a question if there's epigenetic changes, so changes to the DNA that aren't uh, the actual coding uh, parts itself, but some of the modifying factors on the DNA. Could there be changes in these associated with DNA fragmentation? Science will tell us. So with all this information in the medical literature, the question is who can benefit from a DNA fragmentation test? Well, there's three common scenarios that I order DNA fragmentation tests in. So couples with unexplained infertility. So these are individuals that have had the semen analysis test, they've had the hormone profiles, and everything looks normal, and everything looks normal on the female side as well. This is a, a couple that could be potentially benefit from a DNA fragmentation test. Couples with recurrent pregnancy loss, as we saw from some of those studies, they can potentially benefit from DNA fragmentation tests. And couples that have had one or more uh, failed cycles of IVF ICSI, and we don't have a good explanation as to why. Sometimes we can look at the sperm DNA fragmentation test and see if this is abnormal or not. So if we find abnormal DNA fragmentation, do options exist to treat abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation? Well, the answer is yes. So if we can find reversible causes, we try to modify these and optimize them. Smoking, prolonged abstinence, meaning uh, a long time since the previous ejaculate, the sperm that are not being evacuated routinely can have slightly increased DNA fragmentation. Obesity, medications that can cause DNA fragmentation, such as those antidepressants, SSRIs, in situations where that's safe to do so. And those individuals with excessive exercise and DNA fragmentation, it might be worth experimenting, reducing the exercise within a, a reasonable amount to see if there's a change. If the individual has a varicocele, uh, which is a dilated vein in the, the tubes going down to the testicle, so there's pooling of blood, increased temperature, um, several other mechanisms that we think varicose seals can impact sperm health and production. Fixing this can certainly uh, reduce DNA fragmentation by a certain extent and use of testicular sperm. We'll talk a little bit more about this in some of the medical literature around it, uh, but certainly testicular sperm as a whole has a lower DNA fragmentation rate and might be a benefit. 
And then there's some evidence to suggest perhaps antioxidant supplements could benefit, but largely this is an unanswered question. So using testicular sperm for high sperm DNA fragmentation. Well, there's certainly some studies that have been looking at this. Again, one of these meta-analyses that looked at all the studies out there and combined the results through a very clever statistical method to arrive at an answer. So in this particular study, they included five uh, additional studies within it. Here, the patients had IVF ICSI failure or idiopathic infertility along with increased sperm DNA fragmentation. When they looked at the results, they found that in comparing testicular sperm DNA fragmentation compared to ejaculated sperm DNA fragmentation, the testicular sperm was actually a lot lower. It's about 8.9% compared to 33% in the ejaculate. So that certainly paints the story that testicular sperm on average has a much lower DNA fragmentation rate. When they looked at t the testicular sperm, the fertilization rate was lower compared to ejaculated sperm with IVF ICSI, but the clinical pregnancy rates, which are more important because that's further downstream, uh, was higher with the testicular sperm in, in these scenarios. So it's approximately 50% compared to 29% using the ejaculated sperm with higher DNA fragmentation. The miscarriage rate was also lower using testicular sperm 9.4% compared to 29% in the ejaculated uh, semen. Live birth rates were also higher in the testis sperm. So this is the ultimate measure when we're looking at reproductive outcomes. Fertilization comes before a clinical pregnancy, uh, comes before a live birth rate. So really this accounts for a lot of the other variables that are not measured. And what they found was that the live birth rate was higher with testicular sperm, 46.9%, compared to 25.6%. So the bottom line is it looks like using testicular sperm in these scenarios can be beneficial compared to ejaculated sperm when we're going for IVF ICSI in couples that have failed uh, this technique and they have high DNA fragmentation. However, there's not a lot of data out there. Uh, as I mentioned, this meta-analysis only included five studies. There's not a lot of patients included in this. And a lot of these studies are looking back in time. They're called retrospective studies. That's not the highest quality data. So hopefully more high quality studies will be performed and we'll be able to feel more confident with these recommendations moving forward. Now we commented a little bit on varicocele repair. So fixing those abnormally dilated veins. So in another one of these meta-analysis type studies, they looked at seven additional studies within it, 240 men, and what they found was that um, those individuals with a varicocele had greater sperm DNA fragmentation compared to fertile controls. When we looked at performing a varicocele repair, um, the study found that performing the repair decreased the DNA fragmentation by about 3.5% uh, compared to preoperative levels. So certainly fixing the varicocele can benefit men with increased DNA fragmentation, but it is a marginal benefit. So in summary, abnormal sperm DNA fragmentation affects about 30% of couples trying to conceive. It may serve as a useful test amongst those with unexplained infertility, recurrent pregnancy loss, or repetitive failed IVF ICSI cycles. There are certainly treatment options out there. Uh, some of these include um, identifying and treating the reversible causes, correcting varicocele if they're present, and potentially using testicular sperm in these scenarios if there's going to be additional cycles of IVF. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like more information, feel free to visit my website or the YouTube channel listed here and my Twitter handle below. Thanks very much.